You're listening to the 95 Podcast from the team at 95 Network, where we host conversations specifically designed to support leaders in small and mid-sized churches. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 95 Podcast. My name is Carolee Culpepper, and today I'm actually here with John Sanders, who is our coaching director and conference facilitator at 95 Network. John, hey, I'm up, so glad to have you as my co-host today. And I'm thrilled to get to hang out with you. If I had to pick between you and Dale, one of you looks better <laughs> than the other. I'll let the audience just determine which one that is. But uh, I'm Honest happy to, to goodness, I was waiting. Today. It didn't even take three seconds for the burn to happen. So I'm very impressed. <laughs> This is just one of probably many over these few weeks that I get to fill the spot here. So I'm, I'm glad to be here genuinely. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Dale has actually taken a little bit of time. Um, maybe he's doing a second trial for a sabbatical. I don't know. I don't know what you would call it. But anyway, so John's filling in for us and I'm really excited to have him as co-host. So today we have David Moreau and John, I'll let you actually tell a little bit about David. Yeah, well, David came into my world uh, many years ago through a book that he wrote. The title of that book is Why Men Hate Going to Church. And uh, we're going to actually bring David back on for another interview in a few weeks to talk more in depth about the message of that book. But anyway, ever mm -hmm. since then, like, like he's been somewhat in my, in my orbit. And more recently, we connected on a subject that he has rolled out an amazing product on talking about uh, helping pastors learn how to preach better sermons online. So uh, I can't wait to bring him on and, and have a conversation with him about this. Hey there, David. How's it going? It is uh, going well, but it's not going well for a lot of our pastors' online sermons. And that's, that's why I uh, have shifted my focus is... Uh, a lot of sermons are being ignored. I mean, we had great pickup on them and during the pandemic when people were locked in their homes and were watching the numbers go down, down, mm -hmm. down, down. Online is the future of the church. It's where the unreached are. And so I'm dedicating myself to helping pastors and other Christian teachers have bigger impact online. I love that. That's so necessary right now, I feel like, um, especially with the last couple of years. So mm -hmm. before we get, dive into that, though, tell us about David Murrow. What's your story? Well, I'm coming to you from my home in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm actually at my church right now because they have better bandwidth. <laughs> okay, okay. These things. <laughs> but um, uh, I have worked in the TV business for the past 40 years. That's actually my day job. I'm not a, a pastor or professor or a theologian. And uh, as re every Sunday I sit in church and I just, my, I'm like, oh my gosh. You too, pastor, huh? You had such an opportunity to create a visual or do something to make your sermon more memorable. And pastors, they just don't know. They don't know how to communicate online on a screen. Um, for 500 years, they've had an attention monopoly. People have walked into the church, they've sat down, they've watched the sermon until the sermon was done, and then they get up and they leave. And um, in the screen world, you don't have that attention and monopoly. You have what's part of, you're part of the attention economy. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I'm, what really uh, is on my heart is to use my four decades of experience in the screen business to help pastors learn the techniques that will get the, the word of God uh, watched online rather than ignored online, which is really what's happening today. Mm. That's great. Um, I read a little bit on your website and um, was just kind of educating myself on what you do. And I love that you said um, online is where the people are right now. Um, it's where, yeah. Um, and and what's, what's, what pastors don't seem to get is when you talk about an online church, they picture, well, they want me to create some cyber church in the metaverse, or they want me to chat with Christians in some other town or whatever. Most pastors really want to put butts in seats. They want people in the room. And I agree with them. The, the, the church needs to gather. The part that pastors don't understand is that online is your new welcome center. Mm. You know, 40, 50 years ago, when people were looking for a church, they would go to the yellow pages and they would find a church near them in their denomination. And then they would show up never having heard the pastor preach. Today, when people are looking for a church, where do they go? Google. And they mm -hmm. type in churches near me. And the church with the best website wins. 
And so, and the, but the other thing they do before they will come to your church is they will play an online sermon. And if that sermon is good and, you know, the pastor lands the plane in a reasonable amount of time, you know, it's not an hour long sermon. Um, if that sermon is an example of really good preaching, they're going to show up in person. So this is the point I keep making with pastors and over and over again. The main reason you want to improve your online preaching is not to create some artificial church in the metaverse. It's because the future of your church and your preaching ministry, the people that you are going to physically bring into your church are going to evaluate you based on the quality of your online preaching. Mm. And we have to make that preaching more accessible, more interesting, more engaging. And uh, we have to match it to the medium that it's going out to, because you, when you put your sermon online, your attention monopoly is done. You are competing for their attention. Hmm. You know, David, one thing I want to back up just a moment. I don't disagree. People will go to Google and search churches near me, but another way that people will come across your church is when your people, pastor, are sharing your sermons. And I know that's something that you talk about. If your if your sermon isn't very shareable online. Um, chances are it'll never get shared. And, and so there's some things that pastors can do to make their sermons more shareable that then are going to come across the news, news feeds on social media of people who are not yet listening to any church or looking, because there, there's people that are not looking to Google for any church. They don't even care. And yet our people, we can preach in such a way that people go, man, I, I want to share that. And so there's things that you say pastors can do to make their sermons more shareable. Tell us about that if you don't mind. No, that's a great question. Um, so in my online preaching, by the way, if you go to davidmoreau.com, you can sign up for my free online preaching coach course. I have a, it's less than an hour. It's mm -hmm. called the nine commandments of great online preaching. And okay. the last three commandments are how to make your sermon more shareable. And if I could just step back for a second, the three sure. doors that your online, that there's three doors that stand between your sermon and the people who need to hear it. And the door, the first door is your sermon has to be watched. Obviously, if nobody watches it, it's not doing any good. The second door is it has to be uh, remembered. And this is true of whether you're preaching online or preaching in person, most sermons are quickly forgotten. And so there are techniques that you can use to work with the brain to help humans understand and remember what they heard. Jesus was a master of this, and I'm trying to revive these in our day. The third door that you have to go through, it is, has to be shared. And that's the one you were bringing up, John. Once the sermon's been watched and remembered, people have to be able to easily share your messages. So I teach techniques like how to use a QR code. At the beginning of your sermon, have everybody pull their phones out, shoot that QR code, and then, and then tell them straight up, as you're listening to the sermon, if the Lord places someone on your heart, wow, my aunt needs to hear this. My neighbor needs to hear this. Oh, if only my friend was here sitting next to me. Well, now you can send the sermon out mm -hmm. by using that QR code. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to get a lot more technologically savvy and use the, the tools that we have that are easily and freely available to us to, to turn our sermons, not just from something that we say on Sunday morning in front of a crowd, to an evangelistic tool that goes out to all the nations. Mm. So good. So good. I, I want to back up even further, David, and, and let's let's talk about the fact you mentioned early on in the conversation that for a, a short while, once the pandemic hit and churches were many of them forced to go online, many that had really been resisting online mm -hmm. for a long time, but that forced the issue. There was a brief moment of engagement and there were a lot of pastors that were really excited, you know, look at the thousands of people that our messages are reaching. Um, and we could maybe even talk about that, like were those numbers really real? Like does when, when I, when I see that I've had 2000 people view mm -hmm. my sermon, did 2000 people actually view my sermon or, or what? Um, but, I, but I also want to go have you speak to the pastor that is like, okay, the pandemic is sort of kind of over. We're not hearing as much about it anymore. We can wear masks on airplanes or we don't have to wear masks on airplanes right. again, all of that. <laughs> So let's let's just get back to the room and get away, get our focus away from online. I wanna I wanna have you speak to that because I I think that's a real thing in the church. We've got pastors that are wanting to get back to the rut that we were so comfortably in, and uh, you're saying no, online is the future. So tell us more. Well, online is the future. As I said, it's it's it is the on ramp. It's the gateway mm -hmm. to bringing people into your physical church. Okay, we can't ignore that anymore. That's where the that's where folks are going to discover us is online. Mm -hmm. um, the the other thing, 
you, you were, our, our, what happened to our numbers, of course, when the churches, when the church buildings were closed, our numbers were off the hook. Um, huge numbers because you couldn't physically gather. And so people tried online church. They tried live streaming. Let me tell you what else they tried. They tried a restful Sunday. What? <laughs> yes. What is this restful Sunday you speak of? <laughs> okay. So Joe Blow has been going to church for 30 years. He gets his kids up every Sunday morning. They go get some scrub. There's all this tension. He finally gets them into the car. They drive to church. He gets them into their classes. Oh, they sit down for church. They sit there for an hour. You know, they stand for 30, 45 minutes while the praise band rocks out and the smoke machine belches. They finally <laughs> sit down. The pastor talks for an hour. Then they, then they get, the, get their kids. They go try to get food at a fast food place, which is understaffed. They finally make it home and they are exhausted. Mm -hmm. This is the, has been the Sunday experience for most Christians. Mm -hmm. Live streaming came along and you could watch church in your pajamas. Mm -hmm. There was no getting the kids up. There was none of this crazy rigmarole that they experienced a true day of rest. And a lot of people decided, this is for me. And these are committed Christians. Now, what happens is, though, when you don't have the physical gathering, the, the impetus to get out and go, over time, you will tend to, uh, oh, well, you know, I'll catch it later. Mm -hmm. I'll catch the recording. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I mean, we've seen the numbers now, a lot of people immediate, like, like they used to do a song after the sermon, you know, at our church, we looked at our numbers, the minute the pastor stops preaching 90% of the audience left, yep. they don't want you know, they were done. So uh, what's happened is we've had this break, this discontinuity in our habit of going to church, we gave them an alternative, they took the alternative. And then they found another alternative, which was to skip altogether or watch later, but then they forget. And this is how people have become disengaged from the church. Mm -hmm. So long story short, what I'm trying to do is help pastors become more engaging online to re-engage those people and then bring them back. Mm -hmm. okay. And what pastors don't understand is that you can't simply point a camera at yourself and do what you've always done and hope to be engaging online. Mm -hmm. Because on a scale of one to interesting, a talking head is a zero. <laughs> and so you, 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 you know, your competition is no longer the church down the street. It's TikTok, it's YouTube, it's Facebook, it's video games, it's NBC, it's ABC, it's CBS, it's uh, Chip and Joe Gaines. Everything that you can watch on a screen is more interesting than watching a man standing in a pulpit with a Bible. So pastors have to get serious about adding visual content, the way their stories unfold, um, better storytelling. Um, uh, everything from the, the head frame, the thumbnail that people see, we just have to start reaching out and competing for people's attention. And that's what I'm doing with online preaching coaches, teaching pastors these things they never learned in seminary because you had a monopoly and you never had to compete before. What would you say to pastors though that are like, this is just too much. Like I'm overwhelmed with this. I don't even know, you know, myself really even how to get, I don't even have a TikTok account. I don't have a YouTube account. Yeah. You know, what would you say to those people because I mean I think yeah. that's a real thing too there's some intimidation there because it seems very it, it is it it is overwhelming but but uh, you know how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time um I, that's why I do nine commandments of great online preaching instead of one package because what you do is you start implementing these things incrementally you try mm -hmm. something okay here's what we're going to do this week uh, this is what in fact one of the things I'm going to be working with my church this summer is how to create a promo for your sermon Okay. Um, you know, television shows are promoted all the time, you know, coming up Wednesday on Survivor, ah, you know, they'll, they'll do this. Well, tell exciting... me I'm watching Survivor right now. So don't tell me how yeah. it goes. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. Love that but they'll, what they'll do is they'll do a tease. They'll do a promo that gets people to watch the show coming up on Friday night or whenever it comes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Pastors need to think in terms of promoing okay. their sermons and how you approach the promo. I see, I see pastors doing this and most of them do it very badly. The way you want to promote your sermon is you want to disguise what people need as what they want. You have to say, why do your adult children hate you? You know, you, you need to just throw this, this, why, why, why don't my adult children talk to me anymore? Um, why are people so divided online? We need to start asking, answering the questions people are asking instead of saying, join us this weekend for a study in the book of Colossians. Right. Mm -hmm. Who cares totally about the book of Colossians? What I care about is I just paid five bucks a gallon for gas. Right. I don't have any. I don't have enough money to get to the end of the month. 
you know, until we start addressing people's real needs the way Jesus did with our sermon titles, with the things we preach about, we are not going to regain the audience's trust. Mm -hmm. So everything from, you know, how we preach, how we deliver it, the messages, how we package our messages, how we present our messages, so important. And these are small things. These are just incremental changes. You don't have to become a TikTok preacher and do a dance for Jesus. That's ridiculous. But, but what you need to do is you need to understand that TikTok is your competition. Short mm. little videos, interesting visuals. That's where the young people are. And so mm. if you're going to compete in an online forum, you have to learn to shorten your talks in some ways, create promos that lead to the larger talk and do things that are visually interesting on screen. Hold up an object or something besides just you standing there. I want to go back to what you were saying about, you know, answering the questions that people are asking. Um, I know, at least for me, and probably a lot of people in my generation, and maybe even a little bit younger, I just don't have a lot of time or patience for like all like the big hoopla, you know, like I, I'm like you, I mean, I want, I want what I'm seeing to be valuable information to me. And so I like that you have that idea of, you know, really just providing the things that people are looking for um, you know, to make your information more valuable and more interesting. And searchable. I mean, it, let's say you're preaching through, uh, the book of first Corinthians and you get to chapter 13. What, what would you call that sermon? You could call it a study of Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth chapter 13. Mm, I'm already <laughs> leaning in. Uh, excuse me. I needed no dose, you know, I need that coffee, right. Or you could call it what is real love. Now, why would you call it the latter? Because that's what people type into Google. People who have just been jilted. People who are, you know, is real love possible? The, the, the people search for this sort of thing all the time. Now, I actually tested that phrase. What is real love? Guess what came up? An article oh, from the Huffington There's Post no about LGBTQ relationships. Mm -hmm. The second hit was an article from Oprah Winfrey. So what if when people typed in, what is real love, your sermon popped up or mm -hmm. a promo, a brief 30 second excerpt mm -hmm. where you pop up and you say, we're all trying to find love. I'm going to tell you what real love is, enduring love, not just physical pleasure, not, you know, whatever your promo is, you know, yeah. it, it, there, we have such an opportunity to reach the world if we are willing to break out of our religious habits and speak to the world on its terms, kind of like a guy named Jesus did 2000 years ago. Yeah. I actually wanted to inter ask you about that. Um, Cause you've mentioned a couple of times how Jesus was really good at getting people's attention and helping them remember his messages. Can you mm -hmm. dive a little bit into that and tell me what he did? He was okay. So he was a crazy good teacher. And the key to his teaching was found in Matthew chapter 13, which tells us that he only spoke to the crowds in parables. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? He didn't stand up and give lengthy sermons to the crowds. He didn't explain doctrines to the crowds. He told them these confusing little stories. And the purpose was so that hearing they would not understand. Makes a lot now, of sense. This is exactly the opposite of what we do in church. Yeah. We lay everything out, we explain everything, right? And then people get it and they forget about it. But if you tell somebody something in a way that they do not understand, what it does is it implants into their minds. If you tease their brain and their brain works on it all week, what if the end of the sermon, okay, okay I'll, I'll tell you a bit from the television business. At the end of an episode, you'll often see what's called a cliffhanger. So and that got that gets its name from sometimes the end of a story the hero is hanging from a cliff how is he going to get out of this you know so next week on batman you know there's batman and robin and they've got you know they're tied down and the joker's about to you know put him into this huge machine or something like that it's to get you to watch again mm -hmm. what if at the end of each sermon the pastor gave a cliffhanger for next week come back next week and learn this your promos are cliffhangers you know if you come and join us we're going to answer the question for you why have your last three girlfriends been psychos? You know, <laughs> whatever the question is, you know, target that on Facebook to young men, you know, or, or whatever. But I mean, there's just, Jesus was such a master at holding a little bit back, teasing a little bit, uh, making you think about it, installing that little robot in your brain that just works on you all week. And I think pastors could do a lot better job at that 
instead of just simply laying everything out, thus saith the Lord, and then people just like, oh yeah, okay, got that, and they stop thinking about it. Uh, David, one thing I wanted to say to you publicly in this audience, I, I went through your free course that you made, and I wanted to just tell you it is very well done, and I got a lot out of it, and I honestly think that what you're teaching in there is good, whether you're preaching, even if, even if there was no internet, like it's still really good content for preaching to a live room. Uh, just so much of how you uh, approach the content and you know, the the tips and advice you're giving. I'm going to say something a little controversial here. I'm not really afraid to wade into controversy, but I'm going to complain about something um, in the church. And this is a bunch of pastors are not going to like what I'm getting ready to say. We've, we've made this big argument about you know, topical preaching versus expository preaching and, you know, preaching line by line. And I'm not here to weigh in on one being better than the other. But when you're talking about Jesus and how he connected with his audience, I, I always scratch my head and wonder, like, why, where does, where do people see expository preaching in Christ? Like when I, when I read his sermon on the Mount, it seems like he was moving from one topic to another. It seems that he often took a visual from uh, um, what, their world, what they were dealing with in that moment, he brings a child up and, and holds a child, you know, and makes a statement about the kingdom of God. I don't see Jesus preaching boring sermons to people. And yet today we've got seminary professors who I'm, here's the, here's the really offensive part who probably weren't that very good at preaching, telling pastors how to preach. And nothing angers me more than pastors who can take the most relevant message in the world and put people to sleep with it. It drives me nuts when I see pastors preaching boring sermons that people are sleeping through. And so I don't know that this is a question or if I'm just getting something off my chest, but it feels really good to say it. Your course <laughs> is excellent. Well, I, speak to that, you know, pastors that may take your course and use it, not just for online, but for just preaching interesting sermons in the first place. How's yeah, that for well, a question? Okay, John, by the way, you're setting me up with some great questions here. Would you just do all my podcasts? Um, yes, I would yeah, be happy to. <laughs> yeah, and Carolee, well done as well. But um, what, 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 what pastors need to realize is they have two audiences now. They have the captive audience that's essentially zip tied to their chairs and won't get up until the sermon's over. And then, and then audience number two is watching on their device. They're cooking in the background. Their kids need their... Uh, uh, their uh, shoes tied. Um, if they get, if it gets boring, they close the laptop and it's done. Okay. So if you can preach an audience, a, a message that captures the attention of audience number two, this fickle, free to move away, free to leave the room with the touch of a button. If that audience is engaged, mm. audience number one is going to be absolutely entranced. That's good. So the techniques that I'm talking about are going to work for both audiences. It's going to make you a better preacher in the room because attention is attention, whether you're watching on a screen or you're watching in the room. The attention monopoly, the peer pressure to stay until the message is over, masks the disinterest of the, of the crowd. Mm -hmm. And a lot of pastors are simply unaware when they lose the crowd. I'm not. I'm a TV producer. I can see when the heads go down, when the people pick up their phones and check sports scores, you know, but the pastor can't see that. He's got bright lights in his eyes. Um, he, he doesn't know when he's lost the room. So John, your question is very good. We, if, but if, but my answer is if you can reach audience number two, if you can reach that mom who's highly distractible in her living room, watching on her iPad with her kids screaming in the background and she gets the message, the people who came to church are going to be absolutely over the moon. That's good. Before we hit uh, record on this, David, you were just mentioning, and if you can't say this publicly, we, we can edit it out, but you were mentioning that uh, you're so, in talks right now about getting this into some seminaries, your course, because you were saying that there are zero courses in seminary right now about how to preach online. You, can you talk about that a little bit publicly? Yes, I can. Um, I'm very excited to be developing a course for Western Seminary, which is in Oregon. And they are they have extensions all over the country and they do online learning. And I believe this course will be a part of their uh, uh, homiletics. Uh, it'll be available as an elective in their homiletics. So if you are learning preaching, this will be available. Uh, one of the professors there saw my uh, Nine Commandments of Online Preaching course, immediately wrote me back and said, oh my gosh, this is what we've been looking for. Everybody's trying to figure this out. They're what uh, pastors all over the country are watching their number, their uh, online numbers crater, and they're trying to figure out why. And so, um, 
you know, what, what I bring to this course is unique in that uh, I don't think a pastor could teach the things I'm teaching because having worked in the television business, I understand the nature of the medium. And that doesn't mean that your sermon has to become entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to become the Super Bowl halftime show. You know, it, you don't have to go over the top. You don't have to preach, you know, pop out of a cake or do anything like that. But it's just little things that you can do that will add interest that make all the difference, even from the way you start your sermon. You know, pastors don't realize it, but the first three seconds is where is, is determines whether people are going to watch your sermon or not when you post wow. it on social media, mm -hmm. because that three seconds is about scroll time. Mm -hmm. Now, if the first three seconds is you standing in a pulpit, okay, you might pick up one viewer out of a hundred. If the first three seconds is you standing in a pulpit and you're burning a piece of paper, more people are going to stop and watch your sermon. Mm -hmm. And that would be a perfect setup to James chapter three, the tongue is a fire. Start your message off. And I mean, start by lighting a match, fire. Um, if you're talking about the fruit of the spirit, it could be you standing in a pulpit, welcoming your guests and hello to all our campuses. Or the first three seconds could be, I hate grapefruit. Mm, you know? <laughs> I like grapefruit. <laughs> or, or you're standing there with a banana. See, you're this already engaged. My, yeah. This is my favorite fruit, but I have a hard time peeling. I, whatever it is, do something to make your sermons more visual. Because that, again, let's go back to that guy named Jesus. Show me a coin. Behold, the fields are white unto harvest. Lazarus, come forth. I mean, he used a man's rotting corpse as an object lesson. No. We can be a little more creative mm. and work a little harder. Maybe not get, that creative, right? It, um, <laughs> yeah, probably not that creative. Well, if you're going to be, close. just make sure that he, he actually becomes alive, because otherwise that's really <laughs> embarrassing. So I'm just saying that Jesus was not, you know, I think a lot of pastors are worried that they're going to offend their traditionalists or that they're going to be seen as pandering to the, you know, the, the, the world or whatever in 10%, 90% of your people are going to love this. And 10% of the people are going to try to take you to the brow of the hill and throw you off. Mm -hmm. And you've just got to say, we are trying to reach the unchurched here. And mm -hmm. I understand that you are so spiritual that you don't need these illustrations, but the people who need Jesus need to understand that, mm -hmm. that fruit of the spirit is like a banana or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's good. And you can usually calm them down if you make, if you explain it in terms of evangelism. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question for both of you and it's and then a confession. Yeah. Okay. Here's my question. Carolee, do you have TikTok? Are you on TikTok? I don't. I feel like that would be a really big that was something that would be something that would suck me in too much. And then I'd end up wasting time on it. But when they come across my path, I do love to watch them. Okay, so you're not on TikTok, but you do watch them. David, how about you? Are you on TikTok? I, I'm not. Um, it is such a cesspool. I, I, That's I would a good be, word. I would be very cautious about my, I would have to think very hard about a presence on TikTok. I will probably eventually be there because that is the fastest growing video platform. Mm -hmm. oh. Boy, we have got to be so careful. But anyway, what's your mm -hmm. question, John? Well, you? My confession is uh, I'm on TikTok. I don't, I don't create any content on TikTok, mm -hmm. at least not yet. I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm, so I'm in the cesspool and I'm, I'm there. Um, by the way, like you, you get fed more of what you watch. So, so you can somewhat control the, yeah. the algorithm that, uh, so I get a lot of recipes, go ahead and judge all you want. I cook, uh -oh. the <laughs> love the recipes. Uh, I, I, there's some, I get a lot of good stuff from TikTok. Here's my point though. I have found that if something does not engage my brain within like the first two seconds, I'm scrolling up to mm -hmm. the next thing. Like, you don't, mm -hmm. and TikTok's a short little video clip. You don't even have the full 15 seconds or mm -hmm. 60 seconds. I'm not giving you that much of my attention. If you don't immediately, you know, spark some level of curiosity by what I'm visually seeing, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on to the next or by the question that you're posing to me. And so here's, here's where I'm going with this, David, is that we as pastors, we can complain about that because I recognize, you know, I've heard the studies about how our brains are being rewired to have such short attention. I get all of that and we can complain about it all day long, but no amount of complaining is changing the reality of what you just said a minute ago. The people who need Jesus are losing their attention span quickly. 
And mm-hmm. so we've, it puts the burden on us as communicators of God's word to take the most engaging message and engage an audience with it. And I think one other thing I'll say, and then let you respond to this, David, is that what, what word of encouragement would you give to pastors who, who are maybe are sitting out there going, look, the gospel is good enough. I don't have to dress it up with any dog and pony show. It just let the chips fall where they may, because I agree with them to some extent, the gospel is the most powerful message. Like it's an an engaging Mm -hmm. message, but encourage them. But also again, just come back to this thing of, yeah, but John can't watch a video for more than three seconds before he's swiping on to the next thing. Does that make sense? Like that tension there of, we have a great message, but we have an audience who's losing their attention very quickly. Ooh, okay. Buckle your seatbelts. Um, the way we have chosen to package and present our message is the weekly monologue sermon. And this was our choice. This, was, this is not ordained by God. It was not commanded that people would gather and sit and listen to a person preach the, I mean, their preaching is mentioned in the Bible, but it's not a weekly ordinance or described that way. Um, so I would say that as pastors and communicators of the word, we are free to experiment with different ways of delivering that message. Mm. And I am encouraging pastors not only to deliver a weekly m- monologue message, but also to cut it into smaller pieces and this is what Andy Stanley and these, these big dudes are doing now. Um, you're Craig Rochelle, I'm seeing snippets of their sermons. I'm seeing promos, custom promos for their sermons. They are realizing that if you just drop a 40 minute monologue online, mm-hmm. your odds of being watched are much smaller mm-hmm. than if you do an excerpt. So what I'm telling pastors, this is the word of encouragement. If you can be interesting for a few seconds, And you can think of that, you know, Jesus said, you're fishers of men. The promo is your bait. Mm -hmm. It's, you don't drop the entire boat into the water. You drop the bait into the water. You know, you don't, Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's good. The way we're going to catch people is not by, hey, listen to my 45 minute monologue about the book of Colossians. No, you're, we're going to catch people by saying, by answering the question, does God really love me? Mm -hmm. And packaging that and, and putting that little thing out there that attracts attention to the longer message. And then of course there are things we need to do with the longer message as well. But that, uh, you know, that, that's something I also teach is how to shorten and focus your messages or to create what I call a wraparound message where you give part live and then parts on video and parts, there's all kinds of really cool things that you can do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do you need a big TV studio? No, you need an iPhone. Uh, All the technology you need is in your pocket. Yeah. So um, there are, there are, to the pastor who says, well, I just want to get up and preach God's word. I think for a lot of us, it's, I just want to get up and talk for an hour. Mm. And, and whether it reaches people or not, it really doesn't seem to matter because, you know, well, God's word's not going to come back void. Hey, it's, you're, it's coming back void. <laughs> it's, what I like, the, a yeah. word I heard you say a minute ago, David, that I really like is the word freedom, that so much of what we've been given in what we've come to call church is not necessarily been mandated by Jesus. It's, it's been passed down. It's tradition. It's, and we have freedom to pioneer. We have freedom to try new things. We have freedom to go in some new directions. So I'm not hearing you tell pastors, they Mm -hmm. should just utterly abandon preaching and that, that, that discipline or that habit. But man, what if we experimented with some new ways of, in addition to, if you want to talk for an hour, that's great to have a podcast, you know, you can still do a sermon in multiple arenas, but what if we, what if we packaged it and presented it differently? So I'm not, that's not as bumpy as you warned me it might get like, that's a, I'm hearing an invitation to, to freedom, to trying some new things and not feeling like I'm breaking a bunch of rules doing it. So well, I like and, it. And it, well, here's a couple of observations about length too. Uh, one time I timed all the parables of Jesus and took an average. Uh, and I discovered that the the median length of a parable of Jesus was 38 seconds. He was doing TikTok before there was TikTok. <laughs> Jesus was doing TikTok in the first century. Oh. So, and this is the challenge I always give pastors. I say, if Jesus is able to change the world in 38 seconds, what makes you think you need 38 minutes? 
Mm-hmm. And at that point, they, you know, they start yelling, crucify, 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 because pastors <laughs> love their, they love their, their pulpit time. I mean, they do. When you ask a pastor, why did you get into the ministry? They say, I was called to preach. Mm-hmm. They see preaching as central to their, that's the part of the job they like. They don't like the rest. They don't oh, like people. dealing with cranky members or yeah. vaccine mandates or any of this junk that comes down on them. They like being in the pulpit. Mm-hmm. And here's Murrow saying, shorten it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you can, one of the things I tell pastors is simultaneously, you have to preach longer, but your sermons need to be shorter. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? Well, you start by, you know, by doing a promo and then you preach a shorter message on Sunday, but you leave time for a Q and A and you can do a video deep dive that if you want to put in more of your stuff, just say, Hey, if you're interested in this click here and we'll go into an hour long discussion about the Corinthian church, you know, you can put all that stuff in a separate Ooh, forum. Interesting. Um, why a few churches are figuring this out and this is going to be huge. Acts 242 says they met daily in the temple courts to hear the apostles teaching. That's been impossible until just in the last 10 years, because now we have this thing called digital delivery. Mm. So if this, if pastor was shortened his sermon on Sunday and then build a series of four or five daily devotions that go out by email, push notification and through the church app. And every morning you get on your phone and there's the, the morning devotion. It's got a Bible reading and it's got a point that reinforces your message that they heard on Sunday. So now what we're working with the brain because the, because here's what we do. We preach this great message on Sunday. The brain immediately forgets it. Right. But if we reinforce it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday and Friday, and we give the people a link to God's word and they read it themselves, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Mm. What are the chances that they're going to actually implement what you preached on Sunday? Yeah. Mm. We, we just need to think differently that, you know, we have this mentality that we have to all get, we have to get it all in on Sunday. And then sun, at Sunday at one o'clock, we, we, all right, my job is done here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You need to be thinking in terms of discipling your people every day. Digital tools allow you to do that. But yeah. one of the best ways to do that is shorten your sermon on Sunday and take that extra material and dribble it out Monday through Friday. That's so good. David, I want to give you an opportunity to to speak to this because there's likely a pastor out there listening to this or many pastors listening to this going, okay, I'm sold. Like I get it. I know there's something there, but there's no way after just one podcast, I'm going to know how to run with this. And I really could use some help having someone walking beside me as I make this pivot, this shift in my uh, delivery of God's word in, in, in and through my church. What do you have available? And I'm totally setting you up with this, but what do you have available to, to walk beside a pastor or a group of pastors to really help them become better online communicators? Well, you, the first step would just be to visit my website, davidmurrow.com and take the free online mini course, uh, 52 minutes long. It's how to get your, uh, it, it's called why nobody's watching your online sermons and how to fix it. Mm. And um, it'll teach you nine key steps that you can use this Sunday. And these are all baby steps. These are not, you don't have to reinvent your sermon or anything like that, but little small steps that you can take, try those steps, see how they do for you. And then long-term, if you want me to personally coach you, I will be offering a coaching uh, program that would cost roughly the same as about one or two seminary courses. And I will train you for either four or six months. Mm. And uh, we're going to be putting cohorts together in the fall. I've got the cohorts on hold right now because I'm building this seminary course and I'm so dang busy um, (laughs) getting that out the door. But once that's out the door, then I'm hoping to build these cohorts. And so if you're a pastor, particularly a young pastor who really, really wants to make an impact online and build your physical church by reaching people online, then I would love to come alongside you, teach you these techniques and then um, one of the things I'll do is I'll critique your sermons. I'll be very gentle about it, but I'll be very honest. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll help you rejigger, re-engineer, get that first three seconds up and running. Mm-hmm. And uh, everything from that to your, your speaking style, your pacing, your, your object lessons, all these things that you need to compete in the online uh, economy would be available through my cohorts. And you can actually, uh, I have a, a form that you can fill out right now and get on the waiting list for the fall. Oh, yeah. that's great. Um, that is all so helpful. And we'll make sure to put all of those links in the pipe, uh, in the show notes. That way, if anybody, um, has more questions or wants to reach out to you, they can easily do that. Mm-hmm. Um, we are about out of time for today, but this has been so 
informative and so helpful. Um, interesting views on like how to kind of change things up a little bit, which I think is really neat. So Love it. Um, one thing that we love to do as we wrap up each podcast, though, is ask our guests if they have um, a word of advice or encouragement or even a word of hope for the pastors uh, listening today. Oh, absolutely. Um, Pastor, I know that you've been through hell. Yeah, mm -hmm. Some of you yep. literally in the last two years yep. uh, and you're doing heroic work. Mm -hmm. Hang in there. There is a brighter future coming, I believe. I, the best days of the church are still ahead of us. Mm -hmm. The institutional church may be groaning, mm -hmm. but the the church of, of Jesus Christ will move forward. Mm -hmm. And um, if I can help you move forward into that future, please don't hesitate to reach out through davidmurrow.com or, um, you know, uh, let's let's figure out what the future preaching looks like and, and um, you know, let me help you do that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, David. We really appreciate you being our guest today. John, Carolee, thank you. Thank you. You bet, man. All the best. Thanks for listening to the 95 Podcast. We look forward to sharing another episode with you next week. In the meantime, visit our website at 95network.org. The website is loaded with great resources created for small and mid-sized church leaders. Until next time, have a great week.